Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Cool. Okay, so I'm Flavio, and today I'll be talking about online data processing with S4 and Nomit. Uh, so those are projects that, that I haven't done during my time at Yahoo. Just in case you don't know, I have joined, uh, sorry, during my time at Microsoft. Uh, as you can tell, I recently was with, uh, was with Yahoo Research. That's where I have, done, uh, I have done this work with some other folks who are still there. When Milan talked and invited me to a uh, to participate and give a talk in, a, in, in, in this event. The first thing I, I, I kept wondering is if this topic was, was really suitable for, for a big data workshop. And so I, I went out there and, and tried to look for references or definitions of, uh, of uh, what big data actually is. Um, so Wikipedia says that a big data is in information technology, a collection of data sets is so large and complex that it becomes difficult to process using on hand database management tools. Um, I'm not saying that I agree with that definition, but that drags me down a bit because this, in the context of this project, online data processing, stream processing, uh, doesn't quite fit in that definition. Now, some guys doing, uh, do, doing big data, uh, Hortonworks, they say that a big data system is supposed to have four properties. And, and this is a lot more vague and so it makes me uh, a lot happier. Uh, you use local storage, uh, to be fast and inexpensive. It uses clusters of commodity hardware, uses free software, and, and open source. So that's great. A lot of stuff falls into that category, right? And so I'm happy now. So now I can, I can pretend that I'm, uh, you know, so this is a topic about, uh, about big data, even if you don't agree with it. Uh, so assuming that it's, it's about big data, let me show you this graph where uh, you know, some guys try to project the utilization of, of Hadoop in, inside Yahoo over the years. It apparently started before 2006. Uh, around 2006, that was used mostly for research. Around 2007, people started publishing these things uh, using, using, uh, using Hadoop, uh, generate, uh, sorry, using results generated of Hadoop. 2008 goes into production, like applications using, uh, using Hadoop for, for, for their stuff. And, and, and that's, that's where the, the, the hype starts, right? There's this cool technology. Uh, if, you, if you're not using that in your application, in your product, then you're probably a loser, right? So you need to use it. And, and at, some point, uh, at some point, every application was in some sense touched by, by Hadoop in, in, in some way. So around 2008, was, that was, that was uh, possibly the peak of the hype, right? Everyone uh, had, had to use it, at least inside Yahoo. And again, take it, uh, take it as my personal perception of this. I'm not an employee of Yahoo anymore, so I'm not representing Yahoo here. Now back to 2008. So it turns out that not all applications could live with Hadoop, at least in the way it was, it was implemented and was running at that time. Some, some applications needed some sort of scalable real-time processing. In general, for things like direct feedback, so you, you take you take events, you process them, and, and, and you know what you know what you would like to know what to do next. Things like optimization, so you're you're tuning parameters of, of a model or something, and, and you'd like to do that in an online fashion instead of waiting for the next the next cycle of a of a of a Hadoop job or of a data pipeline process. One concrete case was ranking ads using click through analysis. So you're processing the, the events that correspond to, uh, to, to, to clicks of users, and you try to determine, and you try to use that, uh, to leverage that, to help with your ranking. So the solution that folks proposed for, uh, for those kinds of problems was, was to implement a platform, a platform, a distributed platform for processing uh, streams. At the time, there was no generic platform available, at least that we were aware of. So it became a research project. But now, let's try to understand first what is, a, what is a stream processing platform, at least according to my definition. So this is a platform that enables you to process the streams. It could be one or more streams. Right? These streams are composed of events. Events could be, could be tweets. 
right? It could be, as I mentioned, clicks of users, right? Clicks on the applications on the, on the web pages you, you're serving. Desirable properties for, for, for this platform. This is the part that is probably arguable. But according to what we observed, it was online, uh, mini low latency was, is an important one. I suppose that everyone would agree with that. Another one was that uh, we felt that it should be best effort. Best effort in the sense that uh, you, we're not going to try to, to process and reflect the, the, the state of processing every single event that comes across the system. Uh, we wanted it to be scalable. It's scalable not in the sense that we're going to have applications deployed across thousands of nodes. It's scalable more in the sense that uh, if, I, if I need to increase my capacity by adding more nodes, I'll be able to do that, uh, that, that, that easily. Fault tolerance, we also felt was important, but not to the extent that, that it would uh, uh, hinder performance or prevent us from, from implementing an application that, uh, that, uh, that we'd like to. But some limited form of fault tolerance would be nice and desirable. And finally, flexibility with respect to the way you use the resources that are available to you. We could have clusters of, a, of a, uh, clusters with nodes for such a platform, and, and we'd like to use those resources in a flexible manner. So all that was, was projected and transformed into S4. S4 stands for Simple Scalable Streaming System. This is kind of an, a historical overview of, uh, of what happened to the project. So the project started uh, uh, around 2008. Uh, this was actually not started by me. It was not part of that team that developed that, that first um, the first version of the platform. And, and at that point, there was internal code uh, in, an internal code base available that some groups used to, uh, in, in, with their applications, with their deployed applications. Around 2010, that same group decided to open source it. So they, they put it on GitHub. Uh, it, got, it got some traction. People got interested. And you see comments uh, across the web about that. And between that and, and beginning of, of 2011, that, that's when I, I personally joined the project and started, uh, started helping uh, those guys with some of the features they, uh, they needed. And at that point, we, we identified two things that we'd like to do. One was, was redesign the system, maintaining some of the, of the concepts, but, uh, but adding some, uh, some uh, of the things that we felt the first version missed. And also move that to Apache because we felt that in Apache we'd have more visibility than, than on GitHub. So we made the move from GitHub to Apache. At the same time, we started working on this new version that was, uh, that was, that was called Piper, which is the current version. So this figure tries to explain or illustrate the main concepts that we have in the, in the current Piper version. On the left-hand side, we have, uh, we have the incoming streams, which I'm calling the external stream. So these are the, the, the raw events that you receive that you want to process. Once you, take, once you receive those events, you feed them to, to an app. An app is, is a, uh, 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 an implementation of an S4 class that, uh, that does what you, what, essentially what uh, the operators that, uh, that, uh, that you'd like to use to process your events. And, and those operators, which we call processing elements, we connect them through streams. So when we're defining our application, we have to say what, up, what processing elements we have, we need to implement them, and we need to define streams that connect those, uh, those processing elements. And so we have the external streams that correspond to the events that we're receiving, and then the internal streams, which correspond to the streams that connect the processing elements in an application. Another thing that we allow is that you connect applications, so you can define a, an external stream, so an extreme that, uh, a stream that an application exposes, and other applications may come and subscribe to, to receive those. And the nice thing is that now, you, you, you don't have to define once, when you're implementing an application, you don't have to, to define all in the, same, in the same app. You can have multiple and connect them in different ways. Uh, so you can couple multiple apps to define your overall application. It also allows you to have different applications connecting by, uh, by, by subscribing to the streams of others. Now looking more closely at, at what, what an app is, we have again that external stream of events coming. We typically have what we call an adapter that receives those events 
right? So those are raw events, and, and they're not S4 events yet. And that adapter, what it will do, it will take the event and, and, and transform into a, a, an S4 event. Transforming to an S4 event is essentially mapping uh, an event to a key. So you define the keys for a, a key for, a, for, for the event. And, and you can add fields to that, um, to, to, to that event, uh, fields that you're going to use in the processing of, uh, of the event. Now, on the exit of the, of, of the adapter, we have the choice, in this particular case, we have the choice of sending to two nodes. So that's because we partition the key space. So we partition the key space, and, and the adapter is going to send to the one, it's going to hash the key, and it's going to decide to which one it's going to go. So in this case, uh, because I have two nodes, the expectation is that each node is going to handle 50% of, a, of, a, of the keys. And for each key that I ever process, there will be a, there will be a processing element responsible for processing all the events of, uh, with, that particular, with that particular key. So, so interesting points to keep from here is that an application defines the key, so you, you tell what, what, what your keys actually are, and, and we have one processing element per key. That having one processing element per key means that each processing element has its own state. And there is no sharing of state across the, the, the elements. When it comes to deployment, so you have implemented your application, now you're ready to run it. What you do is you package your application, you post that on some, on some BLAST repository. Uh, so that BLAST repository can be, can be really anything. It's up to you to define what, uh, what that is. Uh, you can use a simple distributed file system. Or you know, uh, uh, I don't know, some, something like NFS to distribute the the, the, the packages. Now you inform Zookeeper <coughs> that uh, you have published a particular application, and then Zookeeper notifies the nodes that have been allocated for that given application. So those nodes is what I'm calling the the logical cluster that corresponds to a to, to a given application. In that case, the nodes are going to fetch the package and they're going to execute the application in the way I have described before. With respect to fault tolerance, we allow failover. So if, you, if you're deploying an application and you define a number of, uh, of, uh, of nodes that is superior to the, that is greater than the number of partitions you have, then you're going to have spare nodes. Right? So very simple, if a, if a node crashes, I replace, I replace that node with one of the spare nodes. And I can keep doing that as long as uh, as I have spare nodes. So related to that, we also, we also take checkpoints. But the checkpoints are taken in an uncoordinated manner and, and, um, and asynchronously. On top of that, we do, we do for these checkpoints, we do lazy recovery. Right, so we take checkpoints of, uh, of the processing elements. And in the case I need to recover that state, I would do that only upon receiving the first event for that processing for that processing element, which means that when I'm restarting a node, I don't have to pull all existing checkpoints. You have probably noticed that this scheme is lossy because I'm, I'm, I'm making synchronous calls to store these checkpoints. I may, I may lose some events, right? Because the state might have changed by the time it gets, it gets to disk. Uh, this is okay, so we did that on purpose. So we didn't wanna, we didn't wanna affect performance uh, but at the same time, our main goal was to prevent loss of, of accumulated, of state accumulated over extended periods of time. So suppose you have been running your application for, say, uh, I don't know, a couple of months, and you're training a model or, or whatever. Um, you don't want to lose state over, over all that time. It's okay for you perhaps to, to miss the events in the past 30 seconds, uh, but perhaps not okay to lose again the state accumulated over, uh, over two months. So the next thing I'd like to do is, is to give you a sense of what is writing an app with, uh, with S4. There are three particular components you have, to, you, have to, uh, you have to implement. So one is, is the adapter. In fact, you don't, have, you don't really have to, to implement the adapter. You could do that directly in the, in the app class. But it becomes cleaner if you, it's easier if you just do that in an adapter class to make the transformation of incoming events into, into S4 events. So that's why we typically recommend that, uh, that you do it. 
So for this adapter, there is a, a lot of wrapper coding here for you know, establishing connections and, uh, and so on. So I omitted all that. The important part is that, uh, is that you create a new event. We put a, a, a field there uh, with you know, labeled name, and that is the, 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 the content of the event. Uh, and that's supposed to be the, the name of a person. By the way, this is not supposed to be a very useful example. It's just to give you a sense of uh, how, how you do that. Um, now, once you have that adapter, the next thing to do is to implement the, the, the application or tell S4 what is the actual topology that is going to process those, uh, those events. And in this case, we have one processing element that is called, that is called uh, uh, hello PE, and we have one stream. So this stream is coming, is coming from the adapter, as I, uh, as I have just defined. And, and that processing element, which I haven't shown yet, will, uh, will process it. One interesting point here is that when I'm defining the stream, I have to define what we call the key finder. The key finder essentially extracts the key from, uh, from, from, from the event. And that's, again, what we use to hash and define to which partition the event is going to go. So finally, we have the hello PE. It does something very complex, which is printing out hello plus the, the name in the event. So in this particular, again, in this particular application, all, uh, all you're doing is taking a name, uh, sending that as an external event, processing that through the adapter, transforming that into an S4 event that contains a name, and, and, uh, and, and printing it out. So there is one single PE. Uh, but the idea is that you could have multiple and you, connect, you can connect them in, in various ways. So about Piper, I mentioned that we decided to go with, with a different design compared to uh, what we did, it, well, compared to what was done initially. One of the points that uh, we realized, as, as, as I mentioned, is that state loss upon node crash was, was a problem that could have been state accumulated over extended periods of time. And, and, and that was a problem. A rigid communication layer, so everything was implemented with, with UDP, and, and we would like to have at least a possibility of, uh, of using TCP. So we implemented a different communication layer that allowed for, for, for different protocols. The third point, which is pretty subjective, is it, it, it was hard to use debug and, and, and deploy. Um, <coughs> It's hard to say exactly why that's the case, but we have, what we have done is we try to automate a lot of, uh, of the problems that people have identified and have, uh, have told us about, in particular with respect to, uh, to, to deployment, how to, run in a, in a, how to put an application to run in a cluster. Uh, <laughs> and, and the last one, which is no regression test, and it, sh it shouldn't be like that at all. And so we have fixed that. So these are the... the the improvements I have mentioned. So we, now we have dynamic coupling of applications. Uh, so you can have an application exposing a, a, a stream and, and, uh, and other applications connecting to that stream and, and, processing, and processing those events. Uh, we can have communication via TCP, so that helps with things like throttling, retransmission, flow control, etc. And with respect to fault tolerance, we provide, as I mentioned, some limited form of fault tolerance. So we have checkpointing and, uh, and node failover. Um, but let me, let, let me stop talking about S4 now and, and ask this question, which has a pretty obvious answer, which is, what other ways that are, are out there of achieving low latency? One of, one of um, the other ways that we have investigated was, was this incremental processing along the lines of what Percolator proposed. In, in, in Percolator, that, the idea is to use... Um, Essentially, two concepts, distributed transactions and observers, uh, running on, on top of Bigtable to, to implement incremental processing. The use case I mentioned is related to just the search index and, and essentially preparing documents to be inserted into, a, into the live index. They wanted to do that in, a, in an online manner because uh, previously, and, and I suppose that most search engines were doing that at some point, uh, sorry to tell these days, but you would you would you would build your collection, and every now and then you would, uh, you know, perhaps in cycles of several hours, you would you would regenerate your index. So the delay between getting a document, crawling a document, and making it available for uh, for search queries 
was pretty long. And so with this, you can, you can reduce that time between crawling a document uh, or a new version of a document and make it available in the index to two seconds. The project that I, that I, that I will talk about is, about is only about transactions. So you focus on the transactions aspect of that incremental processing. But why transactions? So with traditional, traditional MapReduce, we have, we have a data set, we process that data set, and we generate a, a, an output. What if, what if instead of doing that, I just do my processing on top of, of the data itself? So I generate an initial data set, let's say, and as I receive updates, I, I can just run them and modify directly my, my, uh, my shared state. So, and that's the whole idea. So I can, I can do the updates directly into, uh, into, into the shared state. And, and I'd like the properties of a transaction because I might have a large number of clients and there is concurrency into, uh, into, making, this, uh, into making these updates. Now, if I compare it to the way that S4 does the processing of, uh, of, of events, Right, so again, you can see what we have just discussed as, as the processing of events. I'm receiving these events, and I'm, I'm, I'm running uh, whatever result of the processing of that event. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm modifying, I'm implementing it directly into, into the shared state. Now with S4, data lives in memory. So each of those processing elements I mentioned um, has its own state, and that's, that's not shared. And so S4 platforms along the lines of S4 are very good for uh, for uh, applications that can live with uh, with uh, with that constraint because we can do that we can do things very fast. Now with this incremental processing, uh, we bring the computation close to, to the data and we have these large data sets that uh, that we're operating that we're operating with. And so we have this uh, this advantage uh, compared to S4 that we have this large state, but we are probably paying the penalty of a, a slightly higher latency when we are doing this processing of uh, of, uh, of events. And as I said, Omid targets lower latency for, uh, for, uh, for, for transactions. Uh, this is roughly the, the, the Omid architecture. We have, we have chosen to avoid uh, having a, a, to avoid having locks. We use a centralized oracle that we call a status oracle. So th that entity, that guy there is responsible for making decisions about what transactions commit and what transactions do not commit. We do not, we do not make modifications to, to the database we're using. In, in our implementation, we have used HBase, which is a clone of, a, of, of Bigtable. And there is a third, uh, a third thing that we do, which is we try to replicate as much as possible the state of the Oracle to the client so that the client can make its own decisions about, about uh, how to read and how to modify state in, in the database. So by doing that, by moving part of the state, by removing the, the status oracle out of the critical path, uh, we are able to, to support a higher number of clients because obviously the status oracle becomes a, becomes a bottleneck. Right? So it's one single entity and everyone has to go, go to it for, uh, for processing transactions. So I'm not going to be talking about, about the protocol. Um, so if you're interested, we can talk more about this uh, either offline or I can give you pointers. The one thing I'd like to show is just this graph, which illustrates that we can get pretty high throughput with, uh, with this scheme that, uh, that we have shown. The different curves correspond to, uh, to different sizes of, uh, of transactions expressed as a number of rows that we, uh, that we update. Um, one use case that has been mentioned in, in, in a recent talk by one of the guys that I used to work with during Hadoop Summit was this case of a news, rec uh, news recommendation. So the idea is that users with a similar interest are, are clustered, and when you receive a new article, you check which of those clusters might have, uh, might have interest in, a, in, in that particular article. And you essentially recommend the, the, the article to the users in, in that particular cluster. The problems that transactions solve here are first concurrent operations reconfiguring the cluster, so you could have multiple clients, multiple clients uh, uh, reconfiguring the clusters of, of, of the application, and that could lead to inconsistent state. Also, when queries, queries come while the clusters are being, uh, are being reconfigured. Okay, so, so that's pretty much all I had to say. Uh, 
to summarize what I have talked about, I discussed online processing. The goal is, is in very few terms, to receive events and make them ready for consumption fast. You don't want to wait for a next cycle of a map reduce job to, uh, to make it available for, for consumption. In particular, I discussed two techniques, uh, stream processing, where events are processed against a, a small amount of, uh, of local memory, and we can make that very fast. I think the last time we, we, we checked, you have, uh, we're getting like <coughs> over 250,000 events per node per second. And, and the other technique was incremental processing, where instead of having one small amount of, uh, of local state per processing element, I have a large shared state where uh, transactions operate against. And, and I could, and in that case that I have that shared state, I have to pay the price of a slightly higher latency, but I can still call that online because I can do that in a, in a, in a, within the order of seconds. Uh, so some acknowledgments, these are folks that have put a huge amount of effort there and, and have done actually most of the job. So, so yeah, thank you, and uh, I'll take questions if there is any.